Stanford University. Good afternoon. I'm Karen Bartholomew of the Stanford Historical Society's Program Committee, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here today. Presentations about computer science usually focus on the present and predictions for the future. The Stanford Historical Society is uniquely positioned on campus to consider how our academic departments, such as computer science, have developed and changed over time. Today, we commemorate 60 years since the arrival of George Forsyth to fill the first faculty billet designed for computer science research and teaching. Our thanks to the five distinguished faculty members on our panel today. From your left, moderator Alex Aiken, the busy chair of computer science, who, luckily, is not climbing the Himalayas or sailing a distant sea. Don Knuth, a longtime member of the Historical Society, who took out time from wrapping up work on Fantasia Apocalyptica, his composition for organ with video accompaniment that will have its world premiere next January. Ed Feigenbaum is the one panelist who was here when computer science became a department in 1965. Another founding faculty member, former provost William Miller, is in the audience right here in the second row. Nils Nilsson, chair of the department when it moved to the School of Engineering and soon thereafter added the undergraduate major, has come down from Oregon to join us. Mehran Sahami, the only panel member to have graduated from the department, is such a popular teacher that the fire marshal showed up in fall 2012 to clear students from the aisles in his jam-packed classroom. <laughs> Obviously, we have an all-male panel. We could have invited former department chair Jennifer Whittem, but she's been on sabbatical this year, teaching computer science in Sri Lanka, Bhutan, Bhutan, Tanzania, and Chile, to name a few spots around the world. Two days ago, she took up her post as Stanford's new Dean of Engineering. Her husband, Alex, is here today. I said, just uh, to give you an idea of what we thought we would do, uh, each of us is on the panel is going to speak for a few minutes. Uh, we're going to try to keep those remarks uh, reasonably brief, uh, but there's five of us, so that'll go for a little while. And then we'll have some questions uh, among the panelists. I, as moderator, I'll pose a few questions for the panel to answer, and then we're going to open it up for the audience uh, at some point uh, down the road. And I thought with my time um, that I would uh, give a little bit of a historical perspective, not just on the department, but all of computer science. And I should have realized uh, that, that I would not, um, there'd be many people, even in the audience, who know much more about this than I do. I haven't been around as long as some people. Um, and so, you know, seeing Bill Miller here, who was, you know, here at the founding, and, and Phil Gibbons, I'm uh, sorry, Jim Gibbons, who had a, a big role in, uh, in, in the department's history, uh, makes me wonder if I'll say something wrong. But I'm sure people will correct me There'll be plenty of opportunities. So uh, I thought I would start with the prehistory of computer science. So if you go back to the 1930s and, and 40s, two people really stick out in the memory of the field. One is Alan Turing, and the other is John von Neumann. And today, Turing is remembered for his theoretical contributions, and von Neumann is remembered as an engineer who built the first uh, really practical stored memory computers. In their lifetimes, actually, they were known for other things. Von Neumann was actually known as a theorist, and, and Turing, uh, although it wasn't well known at the time, what became, you know, what was very much appreciated for his work on, uh, on, on computers and security and, and, uh, uh, and the Enigma machine during World War II, cracking the Enigma code. And so these guys were you know, very well known. They actually knew each other. Um, and there's a famous quote from von Neumann uh, at the very you know, beginning of computer science as a discipline saying, I bet we can build one of Turing's machines. And going off and doing that and helping to start the computer industry. And this split between the theory, uh, the, the math side of computer science, and really the electrical engineering, the, the building of things side of computer science, 
uh, has persisted in the personalities of departments and in the way departments have evolved down to this day. And we'll be talking about that some uh, later in the panel. So the 1950s, uh, before there were computer science departments, there was a computer industry. And so IBM 704 was the first commercially successful computer. And here's a picture of it uh, from that period of time. And, and the fact that it became so quickly successful and, and people were using computers to do things led, to, you know, in part, in part that was the, the, what led to the excitement and the interest in academia and spawn, in starting up uh, the academic interest in, in computer science as a, as a field. So then in the 1960s, what happened? Well, we started to get computer science departments. And we had our 50th anniversary recently, but if you search on the web for 50th anniversary of computer science department, you will find that there are many, many computer science departments that started within a few years of each other, okay? So everybody is celebrating their 50th anniversary right around now. Okay, within a few years of each other. So the field really appeared uh, almost wholly formed in a way in the mid-1960s. Uh, all the people in the universities who have been working as individuals on computer science-like problems came together and formed departments in lots of different universities. So then, once there was a computer science department here at Stanford, what happened? And now I thought for the, the rest of my presentation, every slide will just be two pictures, one, you know, one pair per decade. What was going on in the world with computers and what was happening at Stanford? I'll just pick one thing from each decade. So in the 1970s, uh, the dominant computing platform was the IBM 360. And so here's this room-sized machine uh, that everybody used during that time. And I, I actually, I started programming on one of these machines. And you know, what was going on at Stanford? Well, there was a guy at Stanford who was defining something called TCP IP. All right, so it was Vint Cerf, and this was uh, the protocol that uh, became the language of communication on the internet. Okay. In the 1980s, machines had gotten a lot smaller. All right. So they had shrunk from room size down to something that you could put on your desktop, and the PC revolution began, and people began to put uh, computers on every desk and in every home. All right. And what was happening in, the, you know, in research in the department at that time? Well. I picked, there were a number of things I could have named from the 80s. I'll pick MIPS Technologies, the company that, the research that was done here on RISC microprocessors and the company that was founded out of that by John Hennessy and his colleagues as the example. So then in the 1990s, uh, what does this picture represent? This is a map of the internet. So the 1990s was really when the internet became a public phenomenon and everybody uh, became aware of the potential of computers and, and of computer science, became, began to permeate uh, the consciousness of, of lots of people outside of academia and business. And what was happening in the, oh, and I, one thing I wanted to point out about this is that this, this well, part of the reason this succeeded at this time was because of the work that had been done 20 years earlier, okay? So the TCP IP work that I mentioned from the early 1970s was part of the foundation that led to uh, you know, this worldwide success in the 1990s. And that's a pretty typical lapse between research and, and impact in the, in the field. But what kind of research was going on in the 1990s? Well, this is the original Google server. All right? So uh, the original Google server was built out, you know, was encased in Lego, and uh, it's on display. Actually, you know, I realize we're not very good at marketing in the CS department. I think it's in the basement. Uh, and you can find it if you wander around in the basement. It's behind a glass wall. Um, but Larry and Sergey were there at the time and, and built this, and then this is before they, of course, went off and, and founded the company. And then in the 2000s, um, machines got even smaller. They came down to phone size, and smartphones began to appear uh, in, as, a, as a ubiquitous tool of modern life. Uh, people might remember the BlackBerry. All right, uh, not too many people have them anymore. Um, but what was Stanford doing in research at that time? Well, this was the time of the, uh, of the DARPA Grand Challenge and winning the race. So this is uh, in, the, in the 2000s, is, you know, to pick one thing, uh, the first autonomous robot, uh, car robot race uh, took place and the, and the Stanford vehicle won that event, okay? And, and I would point out with the BlackBerry that 
what was the key, one of the keys to being able to you know put um, computation in such a small device? It was low cost, simple processors like the MIPS processors from the 1980s. Okay, and that's why I picked that example from the 80s. So those began to be ubiquitous and you know, widespread in the end and, and have a big impact with the advent of phones of 20 years later. I sense, oh, okay. And then the 2010s, you know, what's happened? So it's really, I decided not to pick a technical thing for the, for the most recent decade, but just to talk about the social change in computer science, how it has become, you know, not just an academic discipline, but a, a social phenomenon. And so now you have uh, rock star computer scientists who appear on the magazine covers uh, of, of you know, widely read publications. And, but then at Stanford, it's become, uh, you know, it has become cool uh, to be interested in computer science. It's now by far the, the most popular major on campus. You know, we have tremendous interest from students, not just at Stanford, but at every university. And so here's a couple of Stanford athletes wearing the, the Nerd Nation glasses to advertise uh, their affiliation to the university. And one of the things I like to tell people when I try to explain you know, the sudden public interest in, in computer science is that it's awkward for us because we're not used to being the high social status group. And it has you know, really, it's, it's, a, it's a significant change in the way the public views us and the fact that we're in the public eye much more than we used to be. And it's actually, I think, gonna take the field a while to adjust to that. It's not, uh, it's a new phenomenon and one I think it won't go away anytime soon. So that's a very brief history. Um, and I thought I would stop there and, and let the other panelists talk more in detail about, about Stanford itself. So Don, uh, you're welcome to come up. Well, I'm going to focus uh, primarily on George Forsyth, who was the person uh, who, who not only uh, ch changed Stanford's computer science, uh, you know, founded Stanford's program in computer science, but but, but he 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 changed the world, uh, and and uh, I'll try to explain why I why I believe that uh, that he, that he more than any other person sh uh, should be considered the father of, of computer science. So here's George, um, and. Uh, uh, I, I, unfortunately, he, he died very suddenly in 1972. Uh, at that time, I had the uh, opportunity to write uh, uh, to write a biography uh, for him, uh, uh, um, and um, and uh, uh, I don't know if you can read that very well. I, I, I can enlarge it a bit. Uh, so. Uh, it said here that his, his foresight, combined with his untiring efforts to spread the gospel of computing, have had a significant lasting impact. One might all, almost regard him as the Martin Luther of the computer reformation. Um, now, uh, it might seem silly today that, that, that anybody would have to spread the gospel of, of computing. But uh, so I'm going to try to explain what, why that is, and the way the, I uh, I strongly believe that the best way to understand history is to is to look at source documents, to, to look at what people actually uh, said and and wrote in those in the days, rather than on some reminiscences of what of, of, you know some rehash of of what people think it was like. And so uh, that's what I want to. I want to give some examples of things that George, uh, that George wrote in the early days, and then some commentary on what it was. So um, now, uh, in fact, uh, in my article, which I, I, I quoted lots of other things that he wrote, and I said much of what follows belong in, in a computer science supplement to, to Bartlett's uh, familiar quotation. Um, here I want to focus on something that he said in 1959. Uh, well, I, I guess a little background first. Um, here it is 19, here it is 2017, 60 years ago in 1957. 1957 was when George arrived at Stanford. Well, he had he'd actually been an instructor in math department right after getting his PhD early in the 40s. But, but then he came back to Stanford in, in 57 and, uh, and he was invited uh, primarily by, by uh, 
uh, Dean Bowker, uh, uh, the man who, who later, uh, w w at the time, Bowker was, was chair of statistics department at Stanford, and later, uh, many of you know, he became chancellor at Berkeley. Um, so Bowker uh, was very interested in uh, applications of, of, of mathematics uh, to, to new things, and, and, and he uh, uh, convinced the math department to, uh, to bring in a person who was going to you know, take Stanford in applied directions, in, in a new applied direction, and 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 uh, George was the, was the ideal person for this, um, and and uh, uh, so uh, uh, at that time Jack Harriet had already been here uh, uh, teaching the computer students. Stanford didn't have a, a big fancy computer like the like the 704 that Alex showed. Uh, but but uh, IBM had donated uh, a 650 computer, much smaller machine, uh, 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 to about 100 different universities around the country, and Stanford was one of the places where this was. So that's what that's what he taught in those days, and we had uh, and people that it, th these machines uh, didn't take quite as big a room as the 704, but they but but they took lots of space and also you know and you punched cards and we did all kind of. Interesting things. Well, well, uh, in 1959, George wrote uh, an, an article trying to explain to mathematicians why they might be a little bit interested in computers. And and one of the things he said was was that the uh, at the bottom here, the, the majority of our undergraduate math majors are lured at once into the marketplace, where they are greatly in demand as servants of the fast multiplying family of fast multiplying computers. Okay. Now. Um, so e even in the 50s, uh, uh, there, there, was, uh, there were jobs for, for, for people who knew about this strange machine. Um, now, um, uh, the, uh, in, in 1961, he's, he's using the word computer science for the first time in his writing. And, and, and here's, uh, uh, I guess, the, the, the point I want to make most is that in 1961, almost nobody in the world saw of uh, 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 computer science as a science or as something that that one one would study in college uh, you would learn how to you would learn how to write a program and then you would use that to solve problems in business or physics or or, or whatever you wanted to do but that was just uh, like learning how to use a, 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 a other other equipment in your laboratories um, and uh, 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 so, uh, in, in particular, if there was anybody in the world that ought to have have thought of computer science maybe as a as something relevant to universities, it might might have been me because I, I I was in love with computers. I had been working heavily with them for years, but it never dawned on me that that, that anybody would ever want to teach teach this material, um, but uh, uh, or, or or learn it. I mean, you know, I mean, I I, I knew it was cool, uh, but that was. It, you know, it, 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 but that was my job. But then I come to the university and I would do mathematics, and, and, and that was completely different. So, so I never saw any any connection with the team. But but George already, uh, you know, had been thinking a lot about a lot about this, and and so here, uh, in 1961, uh, uh, he he he's writing in an art article for an educational journal. It says computers are developing so rapidly, even computer scientists cannot compete keep up with them. It must be bewildering. To most mathematicians and engineers, in spite of the diversity of the applications, um, uh, the methods of attacking the difficult problems with computers um, show a great unity. So the name computer science, sciences, plural here, <laughs> is being attached to the discipline as it emerges. It must be understood, however, that this is still a young field whose structure is still nebulous. The student will find a great more, m many more problems than answers. Now, um, uh, as I say, uh, at Stanford, uh, George had just uh, uh, had joined the math department, and in 1961, it became officially a division of the math department, uh, and which which meant basically that they uh, uh, that that he that George could hire people who weren't doing pure mathematics, and 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 work and. He, he could hire John McCarthy, who probably would not get an appointment uh, uh, in the math department unless there was such a division had been set up. Uh, so, so, so George saw that there was this great opportunity uh, for a future field to 
called computer science and that there was going to be a, 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 lot, of, uh, a lot of depth to it. Um, and, and, uh, and he went around tirelessly uh, uh, championing it. Now, now, George was a, a graduate of Brown University, and, and, uh, and at, uh, that same year, he, he gave a talk at Brown University. Oh, oh, sorry, I, I, I pushed the wrong button here. Um, so now I'm going to uh, sh show you. Uh, and, and, and of course, most of the people uh, in the world at that time thought that the purpose of computers was to compute. Um, and that uh, uh, this was something that for people who who did a, who you know needed to crunch numbers so so they, they would get a computer, but but uh, and George had been uh, d doing a lot of work with 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 uh, uh, calculations in meteorology and so on, but but uh, he, he one of the reasons he 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 knew that c computer science was going to be a big thing uh, is explained in this talk. So here so here's what he said at, at Brown University in '61. Uh, Machine-held strings of binary digits can simulate a great many kinds of things of which numbers are just one kind. For example, uh, b binary digits can simulate automobiles on a freeway, chess pieces, electrons in a box, musical notes, Russian words, patterns on a paper, human cells, colors, electrical circuits, and so on. To think of a computer as made up essentially of numbers is simply a carryover from the successful use of math mathematical analysis to study models. Enough is already known of the diverse applications of computing for us to recognize the birth of a coherent body of technique, which I call computer science. Whether computers are used for engineering design or medical data processing or composing music or other purposes, the structure of computing is much the same. We are extremely short of talented people in this field, so we need departments. We need curricula, research, degree programs in computer science. I think of the computer science department, <coughs> this is 1961, this is way early, eventually including experts in programming, numerical analysis, automata theory, data processing, business games, adaptive systems, information theory, information retrieval, recursive function theory, computer linguistics, and so on as these fields emerge in structure. Universities must respond to this revolution with far-reaching changes in the educational structure. Well, so, so anyway, uh, uh, he was presenting ideas there that, that, would, that were revolutionary even to people like me. Now, um, uh, I, don't have, I don't have time to go into much detail, but, uh, but I, I get myself in the story a little bit, because here's a letter that I found in my files that I wrote to George in 1963, and at the bottom it says, I appreciate very much your offer to join the faculty at Stanford. Um, and, uh, and George was actually, I think every, every computer scientist in the country uh, received at least two job offers from George about this time. I mean, he, uh, uh, so, so uh, well, it wasn't a time for me to move at that time, but anyway, uh, this is just so, so, so some indication of it. Um, now, um, uh, it, in, um, in 1965, as it was mentioned, uh, 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 this division officially moved out of, of mathematics department and, and into... Uh, uh, and, and, and became the department of computer science at Stanford, and it was one of the it was one of the first in the in the country. Um, but as as Alex said, a lot of a lot of such departments uh, uh, came about at that time. Uh, the amazing thing is that uh, that it went from zero to 100 uh, percent in about 10 years. By 1975, almost every university in the world had a computer science department, but in 1965, it was was almost like zero. And uh, that's a phenomenon that uh, that uh, that uh, well, I, I um, uh, my re the way I, I understand it is that there are, that, that there were a lot of people in the world who who had a particular set of uh, a, a profile of, of of skills that that made them uh, resonate with with computing machine and, and they they didn't have a home but once there was a name for a place and a once uh, and a name for the topic and a and, and a place for them to meet, they, they, they discovered each other, and, and so the whole thing gelled. But, be, but, but before then, uh, uh, yeah, and that, that's the only way I, I can account for the fact that it, it became so successful so, 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 so often. Now, um, uh, in, in um, 1965, um, uh, 
uh, when, when we got the new department, uh, Ed, Ed Feigenbaum wrote a, uh, it, uh, a little newsletter that was sent out that year, and, and, and he said, uh, uh, George was the producer and director, author, scene designer, and casting manager of this hit show. <clears throat> uh, okay, now, um, uh, Later, he, George gave an, invited. A, 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 this was 1968. Now, uh, George gave a uh, invited address at the International Congress uh, of uh, of Information Processing, and and uh, and and he said here it says the question what can be automated is one of the most inspiring philosophical and practical questions of contemporary civilization. Uh, I really. I, I really love this uh, because, to me, that's the essence of why why computing is so wonderful in universities. Is that um, it, is that thinking about how to uh, how to uh, uh, explain something to a computer is the best way to learn something. Let me explain it this way: uh, pe people often say that, the, that if you want to learn about some topic, the best way is to teach to somebody else. And the answer is no, it's, it's even better if you can teach it to a computer. Because then you really have to understand it. it you, you, you don't really have to understand a subject very well to teach it to another person, because the person can nod his head and say yes. But, but if you can explain it to a computer, then you've got it. Then you've got it now. And this applies to chemistry, biology, music, whatever. If, if you look at it as a, as a question of what can be automated, you are forcing yourself to understand that subject better. OK, so that's, uh, uh, I think, an important, uh, another important reason why computer science is, is so successful and so great. Um, now, um, <clears throat> so that was, as I say, George was, uh, was an inspiration to all of us. And, and, and pretty soon, we could we got to understand why, why he was right. I have one more picture of him that I found I wanted to show you. Uh, here he is at a baseball, uh, at baseball game at, at a picnic in 1969. Uh, 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 too bad, Alex, we should start having picnics again, right? OK, so um, now, uh, but I also should certainly mentioned Sandra Forsythe, George's wife, who, who, who was also a, a, a computer scientist with him all this whole time, and of course very supportive and, and important in the whole development of, 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 the, of the department. So, so she had uh, she had uh, been teaching uh, computer science to students at Pali in the early '60s already. Uh, uh, the, I think the, uh, the first time in the country uh, that that this had been taught in high school. Um, and, uh, and, and later, she, uh, uh, she went on to be the author of the first, t uh, the first elementary textbook on, on computer science. Um, here's another picture of Sandra. Um, and, uh, and, and so this book uh, uh, came out in 1969. Uh, it, as I say, it was, it was, it was the, the uh, there, there had been lots of books about programming, computer programming, but not about computer science. And this book was, was translated into, into many languages. It was a bestseller. It went through many editions. Uh, you know, it, it, uh, it, it, extremely, extremely important. And, uh, and so, uh, so certainly, Sandra it, it is a big thing. Now, now uh, so now, finally, let, let me take a look back 50 years ago. And, uh, and I was, at that time, I was deciding where where should I go, uh, you know, because I wanted to. Uh, I, my, my idea for my life was going to be that I was I would make one move to some place where I could get tenure and then I would stay there, um, and so I wanted to say, well, where should I move? And I and I wrote to my best computer friend Bob Floyd, and 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 asked what his opinion was because I thought that it would be great if both of us moved to the same place. And so, so I wrote to Bob and asked him for his impressions of different, uh, you know, different different places. And so he gave a nice characterization of what, uh, of what computer science was like at Stanford at that time. So, so here's here's the letter, uh, the part of Bob's letter that he wrote to me in 19, in February 1967, almost exactly 50 years ago. Um, uh, so he said, Stanford, one of the best faculties in computing, a very great university in a beautiful part of the country. The only problem is that they are overloaded now. They have 120 students, while Carnegie, where he was at the time, is going from 35 to maybe 50 this year. 
From what Perlis tells me, it might be best to, to let this get worked out before going there, but they may be able to do so quickly. I understand that lack of space is also a problem. Some students are quartered several miles from the department. So, um, and, and, you know, and we were, we were in, in, in five different buildings. And, and so, so, so Bob became uh, the chair after, Bob Floyd became the chair after, after uh, well, he did come with me. And then he became the chair after Bob. After, here, here's Bob. Uh, uh, and he became the chair after George died. And then after that was uh, Ed Feinbaum as chair. So uh, our next speaker is Ed. <clears throat> I'm going to pick up uh, in 1965 at the beginning of the department and uh, try to cover a lot of territory until 1984, because I'm going to hand off to Nils Nilsson, who took over in a brand new era of our department's life in 1985. Uh, I call this um, tale a quest. Uh, it's one of the great uh, plot lines of all time. Uh, quests are not all uphill. Quests have trials. And I want to tell you about some of the trials as well as, uh, as, well as some of the triumphs. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk about setting forth on this quest, and then uh, some information about climbing that first mountain up until 1975. Uh, then I want to talk about the problems, what I call the tests, and then end with a discussion of the pursuit of excellence and the maintenance of excellence over the years. There's, um, what I'm going to be talking about comes from, as Don mentioned, he likes to uh, reference uh, documents. And uh, there's a, a vast trove of documents, uh, which you see here on the right, uh, called the Edward, Fe whoops, sorry, the Feigenbaum Papers at the Stanford Libraries. Mike Keller, the director of the Stanford Libraries, is in the audience and, and helped to direct the uh, production of that site. The site name is given there. Uh, and if you want to find the original documents and lots of other fun stuff, you can go there. So here's the founding fathers and one mother, uh, stretched a little bit into 1966. NA stands for numerical analysis. AI is artificial intelligence. Uh, Bill Miller was our, our graphics professor. Uh, Klaus Wirth in computer languages. Similarly, Jerry Feldman in computer languages. Uh, Raj Reddy uh, and Bill McKeeman were our first two uh, PhDs. And they uh, were added to the faculty in 1966. Art Samuel in AI was added in 1966. And, uh, Similarly, George Danzig, the famous uh, uh, mathematician in linear programming in, from the operations research department. And finally, uh, Les Ernest uh, came from uh, the uh, MIT MITRE Lincoln Lab uh, area to help, get or help us, uh, McCarthy and myself, get organized in the artificial intelligence area with the Stanford Artificial Intelligence Lab. So I want to just mention a few vivid memories of those early days. Of course, uh, there's so much to tell. And all I can do is point to a few things. But the first one is John McCarthy. John McCarthy recommended to George Forsyth that Stanford hire me for the start of the new department. Then John and I, with the outstanding help of Les Ernest, wrote the first DARPA proposal, or maybe ARPA at the time, proposal for the Stanford Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. I actually have quite a lot to say about that, but there's no time to tell you all about that. Maybe in the question period, we can talk about that. I started on New Year's Day of 1965. But that was a Friday. And then there was the weekend. And then Monday came. And I came down to campus to my office. And the very first person I met in the computer science department on Monday, the 4th, was a skinny Indian 
who was scrutinizing a speech waveform on the cathode ray tube of a PDP-1 mini computer. That was Raj Reddy. Uh, Raj and I became great friends over the years. And then amazingly, in 1994, the two of us won the uh, ACM Turing Award together. So here's the skinny Indian. <laughs> I never was skinny. Um, Klaus Wirth was another uh, very interesting story. Uh, I won't have time to tell you the, the Klaus Wirth story, but um, Klaus also went on to, uh, he was a, a founding member of the department who went on to win the Turing Award. Now I want to talk a little bit at length about Bill Miller. Uh, Bill is sitting right here, and I call him a hero in this tale. Uh, Bill Miller and George Forsyth were able to see what I call the big picture. With Jack Harriet, they co-authored a strategy document called The Future of Computing at Stanford. I don't know if anyone besides myself and Bill have seen this document. This was an internal document. Here's a portion of it. This is just a few lines. It's a long document. You can find it in that uh, Feigenbaum paper site. Uh, but at the end, it recommends that a, a cognizant officer of the university be appointed to look over the whole computing and computer science picture. And that person was named in the document as a vice provost for computing. Uh, Bill was subsequently appointed by the provost, Lyman, to be that vice provost for computing, or maybe assistant provost for computing, and that was the very first time that had ever happened at any university. Uh, and then later, uh, Bill became, and I mean this quite literally, the fearless provost that maneuvered Stanford through the student protests of the uh, uh, Vietnam War era. I see enough gray hair in the audience to realize that lots of people remember that. And um, we're talking about burning buildings and things like that. And, um, security guards and Bill working till midnight. Uh, he later became president of SRI and uh, returned as a business school professor and became a, a very famous entrepreneur in Silicon Valley. Oh, and when he was a computer science professor, his graphics lab at Slack wrote programs that helped physicists win Nobel Prizes, literally. So I want to dwell just for a moment to show you that we really thought things through. Why the department began as a graduate studies department only. First of all, we felt that computer science was too much of an emerging discipline and not enough here for an undergraduate program. What the world really needed was more PhD researchers and faculty, professors. So we became the best PhD factory in the country, maybe the world. We felt that computer science was emerging from so many different established disciplines that the education of an undergraduate would be better if the student majored in one of those established disciplines, like mathematics, like biology, like engineering. Stanford already had an undergraduate major a relevant undergraduate major in mathematical sciences. And the students already had the flexibility to uh, change that around, to, change, to basically design their own major. So we didn't really have to do it for them. But the most important thing, I think, in all of this was there was no demand from students or parents for an undergraduate degree in a field that few of them had, had, had ever heard of, computer science. Now, what a difference two decades made. By 1985, parents were pounding down the door of our dean of engineering here, demanding uh, an undergraduate major in computer science. So here's some news from 1972, a little bit beyond what Don uh, uh, was talking about. And this is from our department's annual report. It mentions that we have a new assistant professor, Vinton Cerf, 
joint with electrical engineering. And if, as you heard, uh, Vince Cerf was the co-inventor of TCP IP and later won the Turing Award for that work. We had 115 graduate student majors, uh, 50 entering graduate students up from 29, generating a heavy load of faculty advising. That sound familiar? Um, and the, uh, partially, the, uh, the jump was due to uh, people getting NSF fellowships or other fellowships on their own, and then self-selecting Stanford, way more than our uh, distinguished competitors at Carnegie Mellon, MIT, and then, uh, well, at that time, Berkeley was not in the run. In 1975, the uh, External Advisory Committee for Computer Science, here's a quote. The committee appreciates professor Professor Floyd's analysis of department productivity. Incidentally, the italics are mine. We find these figures amazing. For example, we had, this is Floyd, we had 19, well, I won't read all the numbers. These are amazing numbers. The department is extraordinarily productive compared to other departments in the college, by which they meant the School of Humanities and Sciences. Additional slots have long been a problem. Last year, the department actually lost 1.25 slots. We urge that these be promptly restored. Can you imagine a department growing as fast as we were growing? Interest, the discipline growing, and yet we lose slots? So the, the uh, advisory committee finishes, in all dimensions, the department is about twice as productive as comparable departments at other private institutions. OK, let me talk about trials. Every quest has its trials. We began by living in poverty. Or I should say, maybe more accurately, living on a shoestring. From the very beginning, faculty salaries were only funded at 50% for nine months. The remainder had to be found as soft money, which for those in the audience who don't know that, that means NSF money, DARPA money, Office of Naval Research, NIH, and so on. Even the chairman, Forsyth, was allotted no summer salary for his work. That 50% level lasted a long time, and it was pressure from the government and also the emerging common sense of Stanford administrators that slowly slowly, slowly changed the 50% down to 10%. Now, how about space? Really, space? You need space for a growing department? Well, we were dislocated into eight different locations at one point. And one of them was mentioned earlier, was four miles away in the foothills. That's the uh, Stanford Artificial Intelligence Lab. So the department, the discipline was growing fast. The department was growing fast but Stanford could not find the resources. Now, what was going wrong? We had the best faculty in the world. We had the best students. So why? Because we were in the School of Humanities and Sciences with many eminent departments, a vast school. And our department's eminence did not shine brightly enough. The deans of humanities and sciences came from eminent but relatively static departments. They, don't, they didn't know about Moore's law. They didn't know about growth, that, of the kind of stuff we're accustomed to in computer science. They could not wrap their otherwise great minds around our growth needs. <laughs> OK, salary curves. You've never heard of a salary curve, I know. The humanities and sciences curve rewarded age as measured by years from PhD. That may have matched the real contributions of historians, but not young computer science professors. Maybe a 70-year-old historian is twice as good as a 35-year-old historian, but that's not true of a computer scientist. A 35-year-old computer scientist is twice as good as a 70-year-old computer scientist. <laughs> Institutional rigidity. In the, uh, you heard from uh, uh, Don or, or Alex that the, uh, the uh, number of computer science departments was growing very rapidly. And there was a red hot market for, in the academic labor market for computer scientists. And 
we had the best faculty, so our red-hot assistant professors were being offered associate professorships with tenure. But Stanford would not be disrupted, to use modern terminology, by early promotions. No way. Carnegie Mellon, a fierce competitor, was not rigid. So we lost Raj Reddy to them. We lost Klaus Wirth to the Swiss uh, ETH. And thus, we lost two subsequent Turing Award winners. And later on, we lost Bob Targin and Andy Yao, also for issues of rank and salary. OK. So uh, whoops. fortunately, the severity of these trials abated in the move to the School of Engineering. The, uh, the salary curves were different. Um, fortunately, our wonderful dean here was not rigid. And so uh, the, the problems that we had in humanities and sciences essentially disappeared. Uh, I moved into the chairmanship in 76, and the department moved into the quad, into Margaret Jacks Hall, which Don labeled a sardine can. Uh, in fact, it was not a, uh, uh, he, he did not mean it was terrible. He meant there was more productivity in a sardine can than if we had a lot of space. He can tell you about that later. Um, I hired uh, Dennis Brown as an assistant chairperson. Uh, Dennis is in the room somewhere to help with the administrative duties and the committee work. That's one idea I had. Uh, faculty members hate committee work. So why bother them? Let's just do it for them. But we also, uh, uh, mostly it was Denny's work, uh, to organize a structured process for the teaching of introductory courses by lecturers, meaning let's take education seriously. Let's not hand it over to the research professors who really didn't want to do it. So let's get some really fine lecturers. And as you know, that has continued to the present day. The, the first of those was, has been mentioned earlier, Stuart Regis. And in 1977, John Hennessy was hired joint with, uh, in the EE department, the computer systems lab. So since I was chairman, I might as well take part credit for that. <laughs> now, remarkably, uh, the computer science department has met the challenge of maintaining its world-class excellence. If you go into the ground floor of the Gates building, you'll see something on the wall there that someone put up. As this, apparently, I said it in 1979. We have to introspect more about how our excellence was built so that we will know how to avoid actions that tear it down. You can see on the left-hand side, uh, I managed to get a little image of Stanford being the best computer science department. This was in 1978. But I wanted to check on that for more recent uh, surveys. And the one I wanted was the, the survey that uh, has the most clout. And that's the National Research Council. And in 2010, Stanford was number one according to the National Research Council rankings. So I, I asked John Hennessy once. And then he also mentioned it at his wonderful closing speech at the uh, CS50 event a couple years ago. How come? What did we do? And John said, it's rigorous discipline of hiring only the very best faculty in the world, people who want to change the world. and bring in the great students, which I think is a virtuous circle. OK, well, we have occasionally left positions unfilled. That's unheard of at Stanford. We left positions unfilled if the search in our area of choice did not deliver to us the best in the world candidate. Stanford CS faculty have won every major award that it is possible to win in our field. And I couldn't list them all, including the National Academy, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences elections, the National Medals of 
science and technology, the MacArthur Fellow Genius Awards, even Hollywood Oscars for technical achievement, five of them. And of course, many Turing Awards, often called Nobel Prizes of Computer Science. 10 Computer Science Department faculty have been awarded or were subsequently awarded the ACM Turing Award. And last but not least, we scored a president and a provost. Good afternoon. It's my pleasure today to talk a bit about what happened during my watch as chair of the computer science department. It all started when I was very happily engaged in artificial intelligence research at SRI over across El Camino. And I got a call, maybe it was an email, I forgot which, from Ed Feigenbaum saying, Nils, how about having lunch with John McCarthy and me? So I said, OK. And so we had a lunch. And they explained to me that they needed to have a new chair of computer science. The current chair, Gene Golub, didn't want to continue in that job for another few years. No other faculty member wanted the job. That should have been a lesson to me. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I said, sure, I'll, um, well, let me think about it. I did the usual let me think about it routine. But in a few days, I think I got back and said, sure, I'll apply. There had to be, of course, the usual search, affirmative action, everything like that. So that all happened. But to make a long story short, eventually I was selected. And I got a telegram. I was on a trip from Don Knuth saying, guess what? You've been selected as our new chair. You'll report on January 1st, 1985. Well, that was a bit scary, because after what everyone has said so far, the department was super excellent. What was I going to contribute? So, but anyway, I thought that oh, before 1985, when I took over, I ought to go over to Stanford and talk to some of the movers and shakers. One of the great movers and shakers is Jim Gibbons, sitting right here. You should raise your hand, Jim, because you, you play a role <laughs> in all of this. And I found out. <laughs> I found out from Jim that he and the newly appointed provost, uh, Jim Ross, uh, were anxious about getting something going in computer science. There was no major at the time, as Ed explained. And he explained the reasons for that back in the 70s. But these are the 80s. And as Ed mentioned, parents and students were wondering, why don't we have a major? As a matter of fact, Jim Ross and Jim Gibbons were wondering that. Why don't we have a major? Now, Jim Ross had, a, had given Jim Gibbons some faculty positions to do something about creating some kind of major. And so Jim Gibbons appointed a committee to think a little bit about what this major should be like. And he decided even before I was a faculty member to let me join the committee, which I did. And that committee had meetings during the 1984 fall and on in through 85. And I must say, I'll talk a little bit more about how the major got started, but I must say that uh, the committee had lots of different opinions about what the major ought to be. Its chair actually thought the major ought to concentrate on getting people to know how to use computers in their discipline, whether it be mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, or what have you. Other people thought, well, it ought to involve more systems, more of this or more of that. Jeff Ullman, a professor in the department, and I uh, thought that, well, computer science is a field all of its own. Uh, there were people who thought maybe it ought to be an interdisciplinary major. It's not interdisciplinary. It is a discipline. Computer science is a discipline and ought to be, it ought to be located in the computer science department. 
where it belongs. Well, it was a long story to get that all approved, and I'll go into that a bit uh, later. But what happened first was that the undergraduate education, or the undergraduate major committee, one of their recommendations was, you know what? You really should move into the School of Engineering. So let's talk a little bit about how all that happened. Because some of the people, some of the faculty, uh, would say things like, we're not engineers, we're scientists. Well, yeah, that's fine. You really, <laughs> I didn't say this to them, but they really are engineers. And <laughs> so we decided that we would have lots of discussion among the faculty about moving to the School of Engineering. And I must say that Donald Knuth played a very big role in this because somehow or another, either an email or a phone call or something, he mentioned to Jim Ross, the provost, please make it happen, or something like that. And so we decided to go forward and try to do that. Now, Jim Gibbons played a very big role in all of these things, the two main things I'm going to talk about, namely the computer science major and moving into the School of Engineering. It happened that this Dean of Humanities and Sciences, Norm Wessels, had no particular objection to that. Uh, that was fine with him. And so the big problem for me and for Jim, who played a big role, was to try to talk the faculty into doing that. And we had retreats, we had discussions, and with the fact that Don Knuth came out in favor of it, had a great amount of influence on the rest of the faculty. Everybody respected Don, still do. And so we were able, uh, I forgot the exact date, but I was able to send a note to a, to the faculty, actually it was to Jim, I think, Jim Gibbons. After a long meeting involving much discussion, the CSD faculty voted to endorse the computer science department's move to engineering by a vote of many, and I said in the email, I forgot the exact number, to one. I don't remember who the holdout was. <laughs> but anyway, that was decisive. And so we did move on September 1st, 1985, to the School of Engineering. Now, as I mentioned, Jim Gibbons had some positions that could be used to fill uh, what was needed to produce an undergraduate major. So my next big task, after successfully getting into the engineering school, was to think about what this undergraduate major should be. And as I mentioned, the committee that was discussing this matter went on through 84 and through 85. There were lots of arguments, as I mentioned, about whether it should be interdisciplinary or not. But uh, on that committee was Jeff Ullman, who, was, uh, who I assigned to come up with suggestions for what the undergraduate major should be. And some of the faculty were not too excited about whether there should be a major. They had the reasons that Ed mentioned already about why we were better off educating PhD students. But I pointed out to the faculty, and I don't know how true this was, but anyway, I pointed it out to them. <laughs> you know, Jim Gibbons is a very dynamic person. He's gonna do something with these faculty positions. I don't know what he's gonna do. He may, if we don't do the major, he may expand electrical engineering, and, uh, and they'll do it. And then the computer science department would be known as, oh yeah, you don't have to pay attention to those guys. They're not really doing much. They're all theoreticians. Well, I think that carried the day because eventually the faculty decided and did vote to organize an undergraduate major. And so I then was able to send an email saying at a faculty meeting held on Tuesday, January 7th, 1986, this was quite a little ways after, our faculty approved the following motion unanimously. The computer science department should offer an experimental, they use the word experimental, undergraduate major in computer science. To assure the high quality of the program, <coughs> enrollment should be limited by the resources available. Now resources involve two things, faculty, Jim Gibbons had some positions, uh, which he 
uh, as long as we as long as we convinced the faculty into doing an undergraduate major, he was able to and willing to spread out through whoever could best, best teach the courses that Jeff Allman proposed ought to be included in the major. And we were in fact able to hire many new faculty members uh, in order to staff that major, and we were able to get some resources for it in terms of space because we need ex we would need extra space. So that all happened, and the uh, new major thrived during its subsequent years. As mentioned now, I think it is, is it the case, that it is the largest undergraduate major uh, at Stanford. But um, the first commencement, uh, actually the major started in 1986, Stanford's autumn quarter. That was the first, uh, begin that was the beginning of the major. And it included significant coursework in both theoretical and applied computer science. Uh, the first commencement had eight graduates. It was in June 1987. In 1988, there were 18 graduates. In 1989, 25. So it was on this uh, Moore curve, more or less. Besides graduating new computer science, the computer science department became one of the big service departments, along with English, mathematics, biology, and chemistry. I should mention, I forgot to mention, that when we moved to engineering, we decided on something that was quite unique and was noticed as quite unique by various visiting committees later, and that is that the computer systems laboratory, which was then in the double E department, would be a joint laboratory headed by John Hennessy. You'll all remember John Hennessy. Um, and he actually, um, anybody who wanted to be in either computer science or in double E could transfer between either one of those two departments. So it was a rather unique uh, experiment. But back to the major. The major took off and turned out to be uh, a big success and continues to be that today. There were other things that were going on. A third task of mine was, and this was also helped by Jim, was to get a new computer science building. We were uh, scattered in eight or nine different places around the campus, and there were plans already afoot for a new computer science building. Lots of discussion. Architects were hired. Uh, there was fundraising. Jim Gibbons and I and the development officer, Duane Fullerton, went off to Japan to try to raise funds uh, for, that, for parts of that building uh, during, the, uh, during the time I was the chair. Uh, we visited Bill Gates. And um, Bill Gates, we asked, we were up in Redmond, and we asked him whether or not he might be able to do a donation. This deal was later closed by Bill Gates coming to campus, talking with various people, including Jim, and was, uh, Jim was able to secure from him the naming gift for the William H. Gates Computer Science Building, which didn't get built during my time, but some of the fundraising got done for that. I uh, have just a moment or two to say a little bit about the fact that I did more than just administrative things. I also had my own research. I had some graduate students. I had to apply for funding for the 50% offset, as was already mentioned. And my particular research involved, as you might guess, some things involving artificial intelligence, having AI agents communicate with each other. And that went on for a while. And I was finally able, uh, after all of that died down, and other things that a department chair does, which some of which are a bit boring, and I won't go into all of those things now, but we had visiting committees come and talk to us, and interactions with, different, uh, with other departments, lots of other interactions with other departments and centers. Uh, finally, I was able to take a sabbatical. Jim didn't like that idea too much. Why don't you stay on? <laughs> Why don't you stay on and continue as chair? You haven't done a lousy job, so. Uh, continue. But anyway, uh, some other events in my life came up and I decided I would go off on sabbatical, but I did come back and I came back as a faculty member and then gradually had a kind of declining glide path 
of going down to three quarters time, half time, quarter time, zero time. For a while, I was at zero time. That was great because they didn't pay me any money. I didn't feel guilty if I didn't do anything. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, all of those years were outstanding, and I enjoyed them, and I thank Jim and others here in the audience who helped out a great deal. Thanks. So one of the things these things are always useful for is you find out the truth. Uh, I came to Stanford in 1988 as an undergraduate. And when I arrived, I thought there was this thing called the computer science major that had existed here for 40 years. Um, and evidently, the truth is that it had been created two years before. But you just assume that everything has been there ever since you know, time when you actually get here. Um, so when you also agree to give a computer science talk, if someone said, who are the group of people who you don't want to talk after because it would be really intimidating, that's pretty much it right there. Um, so uh, what I wanted to do was spend a little bit of time talking about some of what's happened in education in the computer science department in about the last 10 years or so, and talk a little bit historically as well. Um, and one of the things being here as a student and then leaving for a while and then coming back is you get to also see the tremendous uh, changes that happened in the department and who laid the foundations for all these things. We got a very nice history of how the department evolved. Um, in terms of the undergraduate program, uh, there's two people especially I'd like to point out. One is Stuart Regis that uh, Nils and others have mentioned who helped get the program uh, started and also have the undergraduate section leaders, which has become a very popular program for introductory programming courses. The other is Eric Roberts, who's sitting right there. Um, and Eric, for many years, was the associate chair for education of our department and was really responsible for laying a foundation for undergraduate education in the department that uh, now I'm just fortunate to be the steward of, um, but really just did a tremendous job, wrote the books that are used in our introductory classes. And so to give you a sense for enrollment growth and what's going on in our introductory classes, so this is CS106A, um, and it's enrollment growth over the last few years. I went historical, but I stopped at 1993 because I graduated in 1992. So what this shows you is the growth of uh, enrollment in that first course, CS106A, um, over time. And there's a few things that come up about that course that are interesting. One of them is you can sort of see the dot-com bubble back in 2000. There was a little bit of a surge. And you know, if we had clipped this graph in 2006 or 2007, it would have looked like that was the bubble. Um, but if you look at what's happened in just the last few years, CS106A is now the most highly enrolled course at Stanford. Um, if you add up the numbers between male and females last year, you get about 1,600 students. Um, there's about 1,700 students in a freshman class at Stanford, so you can sort of do the math. Um, that doesn't mean that this is all undergraduates. This includes some graduate students as well. But basically, we've gotten to this point where a tremendous number of students at Stanford, I'll give you some statistics in just a bit, uh, actually take the class. And one of the things that's also important, I think, to mention, uh, despite the fact that right now up here we have an all-male panel, is that CS106A is actually almost 50-50. It's 45% women at this point, and that percentage continues to grow. Um, but I think the takeaway from this is that over 90% of all Stanford undergraduates take at least one computer science course. It is not a university-wide requirement. It's a course that students take because it provides them the opportunity to be able to apply computing in whatever discipline they want to go into, whether that is computer science or another discipline that can benefit from computing. And so what that's meant, if we think about our majors, this becomes the funnel or the input into the major, is that what we've thought about in the last few years is increasing the footprint of computer science. What does that curriculum actually look like? And so this is just a two-dimensional projection of some areas in computer science. Had it been a different day, they have, would have probably been drawn differently or if I'd eaten something different for lunch. And what we used to have in our curriculum was sort of a footprint that included some systems, some algorithms, some artificial intelligence. And that was sort of the body of stuff that students got. And what's happened in the last 20 years is that we've had many different areas of computing actually grow up to become full-blown areas that we'd like to become accessible at the undergraduate level. And so a few years back in 2007, we changed our curriculum to rather than just focusing on this core, to allow students to go deep in a particular area as undergraduates. And so we had a track-based structure where the total amount of area, the 
material the students cover has to remain the same. We can't just make computing a six-year program. It has to remain a four-year program. Um, but now students can choose the area they want to go into uh, in a variety of different ways. So they can actually choose the depth they go into. And now what's accessible at the undergraduate level is sort of the big pink area. It's what we like to think of as the big tent of computer science. And once you make that available at the undergraduate level, one thing that becomes very clear and is interesting in the historical context of thinking about computing as a multidisciplinary subject is that you begin to see very clearly the overlaps and ways in which computing impacts other areas and in, in turn, computing is impacted by those other areas. So we think about machine learning and very basically at the boundary of statistics and computer science, uh, linguistics and natural language processing, art and graphics. And so one of the things that we've done in our program is that students now actually take classes in those other disciplines and they count toward a computer science degree so they can see the bridges and understand in what ways, for example, understanding biology and actually taking classes in chemistry and biology informs algorithms that they then think of for computational biology and the sorts of problems in biology that they want to tackle from a computational standpoint. And so what that's in turn meant in our program is the number of CS major declarations now looks like this. Again, going back to 93, 94. But if you look in the last few years, basically in one of the things that's also interesting to look at this graph is the number of computer science majors is now over 300 a year. Last year was 320. The year before that, it was 365. That's, again, if you think of 1,700 students is about the size of a freshman class at Stanford, that's over 20% of the undergraduate population at Stanford majoring in computer science. So one out of five students, and a few years back in 2012, computer, computer science became the largest undergraduate major at Stanford. One of the things that's also exciting about these numbers is if we look again at the number of women and the diversity we're trying to create in the field, if we look at, say, 2013, the number of women choosing to major in computer science that year was greater than the total number of computer science majors we had just six years before that. And so part of the idea is if we have that funnel in our CS106A course to bring in a greater diversity of students to funnel that through the major and actually lead to more diverse graduates. And so I'll leave you with one last graph before I tell you a couple personal stories about being a student here, um, is looking at the percentage of women in computer science. That's now reached an all-time high at just slightly over 30%. It was 31% last year. This last quarter, the number of students who declared computer science as their major, 37% were women. Um, and the interesting news is the total, as the total number of CS majors grow, the percentage of women also increases. Of course, the absolute number would increase if the percentage remained the same, but the percentage actually increases, which means that the number of women declaring computer science as a major actually accelerates, and we get closer to that 50-50 number we're shooting for. So with that said, there's, there are some personal stories I'd like to share because one of the things that I got to benefit from was this wonderful history and the folks who were sitting up here on the stage was I got to be their student. So in 1988, I came as an undergraduate and this place is a hard place to leave has been mentioned and stayed here for graduate school. Um, and so there was a few stories I'd just like to tell you. So one of them is um, there's a intro computer science theory class I used to teach. And so one of the examples I could use in that class to talk about students is Don Knuth being in our department. And the actual story I would tell them is, Don is considered by many people to be the father of modern algorithms in computer science. And so I would tell the students, that's like you being alive at the time of Euclid and being a geometer, <laughs> right? And so, not to age you, Don, Euclid's a little older. But for a student to think that they are at the beginning of that dawn of the discipline taking off is hugely powerful. And so that's the kind of benefit of having a faculty like this at the university. Um, I had Mark Zuckerberg actually come to one of the 106A classes that I taught, and you know, he would spend an hour talking with the students, and so I wanted to give him a gift. Well, what do you give Mark Zuckerberg as a gift? Right? I heard he's got some money, so there's nothing I can buy to give him that he couldn't get himself. So you have to give him something that money can't buy. And so Don signed a copy of The Art of Computer Programming, and that was the gift to Mark Zuckerberg. And his eyes lit up when he got it, because that's the kind of thing you can't get anywhere else than Stanford. Um, I was fortunate enough to take classes. I took 
you know, Ed's artificial or the expert systems class, right? And you get to learn about expert systems from the guy who created expert systems. And here he was, a luminary in the field. I was a little bright-eyed, bushy-tailed graduate student. And he was in extremely encouraging. It was unbelievable. You know, you could go to his office hours and talk to him. And I remember having this little project idea that sort of being the insecure graduate student about what's going on. You go in, you explain it. And Ed sat there and he listened attentively and he went through the details. And he was so encouraging. I came out of that meeting just feeling excited about this project because these are the kind of people you can learn from. And when someone like that is excited about something that you're doing, you get excited about that and you feel confident about it. Even if you shouldn't, you feel confident about it and you go off and you do it. Um, one of the other experiences I had was actually starting in graduate school. Uh, Nils Nilsson was my initial advisor in graduate school. Before he retired, he was talking about the ramp where he was you know, heading toward retirement, but he was the person who introduced me to machine learning, which now everyone hears about machine learning and it's on billboards in 101. At the time, I think in the machine learning class 229, when I took it from Nils, I think we had uh, eight students in the class, maybe 10 students. Uh, now the class has 800 students. Um, I actually brought along my original copy of Nils's Learning Machines book, which helped name the field, had him sign it before the uh, panel presentation. Um, <laughs> But this is the kind of mentorship and growth that as a student in the department has been available for many years, and I'm just one example of that. And so it was tremendously fortunate to be able to learn from this amazing group of people about research, about teaching, um, and to graduate from this institution, and then be able to come back and be a steward for programs that people like Eric Roberts, that I took my senior project class, helped actually transform into something that has been world changing. So in that sense, it's been been a, a tremendous experience. There's one other recognition I'd like to make, which is a non-Stanford recognition. Then that's Steve Wozniak sitting there in the office, or sitting there in the office, sitting there in the audience. Um, the first computer I ever had was an Apple II, and it changed my life. And to be honest, I saved that computer. My parents wanted to get rid of it. I was you know, in junior high at the time, and so I went to high school, went to college, still at home. I actually brought it here the first year, but that's not important. Um, got a Mac after that. But I, they always wanted to get rid of it. They're like, what are you going to do with this Apple II? I said, no, 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 I want to keep it. This is the computer I want to teach my kids on. So I kept it all these years. And a few years ago, they mailed it up to me. So I still have, the, I have an Apple II sitting at home. And I got my kids to sit down, because now they're old enough to think about programming. And I said, we're going to learn programming on the computer daddy learned to program on. And it booted up beautifully. Nice work there, by the way. On, um, <laughs> And they look at the screen. I'm all excited. I'm about to show them the first program I ever wrote. And they say, Daddy, why is the screen green? Why aren't there these other pictures? And why can't I swipe left and right? So that broke my heart. But then it also meant I get more time on that machine. So I first, I just want to thank all the people who've actually helped make this program and realize that the program not only has had a long history, but it is a history that now is helping perpetuate itself in the future by creating the students who have that remembrance and want to come back and contribute. So thank you. Good work. Are these mics live? Okay. So I think uh, what we'll do next, uh, given the time, maybe I'll place one question uh, for the panel. Today. And while that's being answered, if other people would like to come forward for their, I don't know where the microphones are, but we'll try to take a couple of questions. The microphones are actually back there, if you could line up. And I think the ground rule will be, each question will be fielded by one person so that we can just answer more than one question you know, before we run out of time. And, and if we can stay a few extra minutes, then, then we can uh, handle a few more questions. And so just while people are coming to the microphones, um, the question I would ask, did you? The question I would ask uh, of the panel is one of the interesting things about computer science uh, as a discipline is uh, how it has been able to expand and create new sub areas. And that those have been welcomed into the discipline even when they didn't really fit the existing uh, model of, uh, of the way people thought in the discipline. And I would pick out human computer interaction as one uh, topic that, you know, when it, when it first be began, it really had a character that was quite different from what was standard. And it's difficult for academic departments to hire people who don't look like themselves. Uh, but computer science has actually done a pretty good job, and, you know, especially here at Stanford, I think we've done a pretty good job of, of moving with the times and, and, and 
you know, hiring new uh, people in new areas. And how does that work? I mean, do you think there's anything special about the field or about the people? You know, how did that actually come to be? Okay, so um, I, I guess I said something about uh, uh, the people who were sort of natural born computer scientists discovered that they had a home and that, that was the reason why the, the field gelled at the beginning. And, and, and uh, uh, it, it, although it's true that we have many, many different ver, uh, varieties of, of, of computer science now, there's, there's still a common core that, 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 that bonds us together. Uh, you know, we tend to use, we can talk to other people that are like us uh, with higher bandwidth. Uh, uh, we, we think of, of the same analogies and jokes and so on. And, and there are other people from, from other disciplines that it would be very hard to, uh, uh, to, to imagine interdisciplinary work with because our paradigms are so different. So I, so I do think that, uh, that, 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 that uh, you can't combine any, in, any two uh, 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 Stanford professors and have them work together uh, productively, but, but, the, but the ones who, who, who share this, uh, 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 whatever this, this, uh, this, this, this point of view is, I, um, I, I like to think of it as uh, uh, under algorithmic thinking, but other people have different names for it. But, but that's what I think it, uh, uh, makes, it, makes it possible. And, and certainly we, uh, it shouldn't be surprising that, that, um, uh, that the things we had in the 1960s uh, uh, did, didn't remain static because, because of, the, of the, the fact that, that, that algorithms and, and, and you know, computer science uh, is, is extremely uh, uh, is extremely powerful. It's not limited to to a particular kind of work. Mm. Well, Alex, back. can I just yeah. uh, oh, add sure. to what Don said? Uh, something um, I think got lost in the in the presentations. Um, we in the department. I rem this is vivid in my memory and vivid in sitting in George Forsyth's corner office in Polio Hall. We were very strategic about what we did. And uh, what, what you said about uh, sort of bringing everything in is not true. We didn't do that. We specifically decided what we were going to do at that time and built uh, on those strengths. In fact, we even, I remember uh, hearing uh, Terman's Pinnacles of Excellence uh, theory about building excellence brought to bear on that issue. But for example, we, we decided, yes, we were going to be great in numerical analysis. We were going to be great in AI. But we weren't going to do what was called information retrieval at the time. We just weren't going to do that. There was a lot of people out there doing that, but not us. But over the years, strategically, we just had to move into certain areas. There was a moment when it was very important, and, and it was discussed at length, that we had to move into graphics. And then we started to recruit people like Pat Hanrahan. And then uh, there was a moment when we had to get into computer security. And then we hired Dan Bonet. And so uh, uh, I would say that it was not haphazard at all. Uh, it, we, it wasn't a big tent. It was a strategic set of strategic choices. Thanks very much for this fascinating and inspiring panel. I'm asking uh, about perhaps the uh, focused contribution that the Stanford Computer Science Department has uh, made and generated over the past uh, 50 or 60 years um, relative to the other great uh, computer science departments in this country. And I ask in the context of developing MIT OpenCourseWare-centric world university and school, which seeks to create online universities that are Creative Commons open courseware centric in all 200 countries and wiki schools in all 7,100 languages. What is, what is unique about Stanford's computer science uh, thinking culture um, that might uh, uh, inform perhaps even further uh, this online open courseware centric university? Thanks. Who would like to field that one? Well, I could say something, and that is because I started teaching. Uh, when we didn't have PowerPoint, we had overhead transparencies and magic markers and blackboards or whiteboards. 
I found out very soon in my career that the students were bored with writing down various equations and derivations on the blackboard. They wanted something more. So I think one thing that's unique about the department is it was, a, it was able to adapt to what the students needed. And so we did, I didn't, but we did, move into, <laughs> move into the use of graphics and PowerPoint and interactive demonstrations and things like that, which kept the students' attention. Otherwise, they would be sitting there reading their daily, and today they would be on their cell phones. So you do have to keep their attention. And I think Stanford's computer science department was outstanding at adapting to that change in what students wanted. Uh, Professor Sahami, uh, could you give us a date at which you personally anticipate that Ray Kurzweil's singularity might occur? No. <laughs> <laughs> Next um, question. No, I, I, I think it's, uh, it's not worth speculating on at this point. Uh, uh, any thoughts on 15? what computer science would be 60 oh. years from now? Anything that is not uh, in front of us right now, but we kind of uh, predict or uh, think about that? So I think, well, maybe I'll take a stab at that. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm going to say that I don't know the answer to that. Because I, I, and then if you look at the rate of change in computer science, I don't see that it has slowed down that significantly in recent times. Um, if I go back even 10 years, uh, you know, we hardly thought, uh, at least in a lot of computer science, about probability uh, you know, 10 years ago. But now, through machine learning uh, and, and other aspects of, of statistical AI, it has begun to permeate the discipline. And you see people using it not just as a tool, but also you know, it, it doing research uh, uh, in you know, the connections between c computation and statistics and probability in ways that I don't think, certainly I didn't predict. And it's, and it's, and it's already, in a very short period of time, been pushed down into the undergraduate curriculum where it's become a core piece of what we do even in our service teaching, you know, to introducing it at a very early stage uh, for the students. So I think with changes like that, even in that short period of time, it's very hard for me to predict what it would be six decades from now. I think we take one more question. I apologize. Yeah, so. Today, communications and computer science are so in, inexorably intertwined that most folks don't think of them separately. Yet that wasn't always the case, as, as Dr. Leeson here in the audience can attest. How did you handle that or consider going forward the whole issues of communications and the infrastructure necessary to handle all of these wonderful things that we have today? And you, know, you look at TCIP, for example, versus the telegraph and microwave, et cetera, et cetera. And yet our whole world, as we know it today, depends on communications infrastructure, and there have been massive changes in that infrastructure. Uh, how did you handle and consider that going forward? I, 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 don't, I just want to answer that par partly. Uh, not substantively, because I'm not a, enough of an engineer to know the answer to that question. But from a Stanford point of view, uh, the the um, integration, or I should say, the intellectual integration between the EE department and the computer science department is so excellent that um, we don't even we we don't even think of that as interdisciplinary. It's the same set of problems. Now that's unusual uh, in in the world of computer science departments, and um, something that grew up here. Thank you.